May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The Discovery Channel has Shark Week, you know, but our lectionary has Snake Week. And since these are really strange stories, I want to make some sense of them this morning. They only come around every three years. Uh, but I wanted to start out with my own snake story. A couple years ago, I went camping in the Sipsi Wilderness over in Alabama with my three best friends from seminary. And we set up camp after walking as far as our gear-laden legs would take us the first day. And our goal the next morning was to find the largest tree in Alabama. We're really exciting people. <laughs> a yellow poplar, though, it's known as Big Tree, to which we had a few vague directions on a map bearing the somewhat unsettling legend of not to scale. And to the surprise of a bunch of millennials who fled to the wilderness to try to escape the tyrannical reign of our cell phones, we also had uh, no cell reception to check our position. So there we are, marching single file on the overgrown trail in the early morning. Benjamin's out in front with his stick and he's catching the cobwebs. And I'm second at a safe distance in his spiderweb free wake. And the other two are behind. And it's like a dream as I'm watching Benjamin step forward and unknowingly set his foot down about three inches from the sleeping form of a snake. A snake, if memory serves correctly, was at least as long as I am and thick as a fire hose stretched out on the trail. So I'm mid-step and I jump back and lose it. I'm swinging my arms around in panic, and I let out the strangled sort of yell and beginning to gibber at them and uh, the two immediately behind me. I'm totally insensible. And I'm pointing and yelling at the trail until the word finally bubbles up from this white, hot panic that is my mind, and I s manage to find the word snake. Um, and they saw it. Uh, again, probably, probably longer than me, circumference of a country ham beginning to slither its mass slowly away, having been awakened from its early morning nap. We survived the sleepy snake encounter, but we had these four different reactions. One of us steps over the snake, completely oblivious. One panics and turns, struck dumb to, t to run away. Uh, one of us takes out a phone and takes a step closer to video because pics or it didn't happen. And one waits for the snake to wind its way off the trail before proceeding on the route. The wilderness. I don't know. You look for the promised land and you find snakes. I'm guessing you've been there one way or another. Certainly the Israelites had been in our Old Testament reading. They're heading through their own wilderness escaping their own tyrannical rulers, their own goal ahead of them. And the text says that they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Sea of Reeds, and they're skirting the land of Edom. Now, the Israelites had better map reading skills than me or my friends, and they knew by skirting the land of Edom that this meant it was a frustratingly circuitous route. One rabbi sympathizes. He says it was a move backwards, a lengthy detour, and the people could not stand the waiting for the desired end. The spirit of life urging forwards could not bear patiently the long, long road for the sought-after goal. The people grew impatient and began to murmur against Moses and against God. Murmuring, I think, is a more evocative translation of the sort of salacious gossip that goes on better than spoke against what we have. We don't have any food or water, they murmur. Someone points out that they do, <laughs> and they say, well, we've got food and water, but it's detestable. We don't like it. And they remember the garlic and the onions and the leeks, 
and the never-ending commodities for the appetite of the empire. And forget that in the empire they were commodities too. So the Israelites are bitten by snakes. Some rabbis say that God set the serpents upon the people. Some say that God just removed the divine protection and that naturally occurring snakes did what naturally occurring snakes tend to do. I have my own thoughts about it, I guess. I guess there's a way that being in the wilderness brings you face to face with the fragility of your being. I suppose it's why we go there during Lent. That like the Israelites, we're on our way to some sort of freedom that can only be found through ashes. The people panic at the serpents, find their words too, and repent. God has Moses put a bronze sculpture of a snake on a pole for the people to look at and be healed. This maybe isn't the image I would have chosen for God to show the Israelites for their healing, given their recent experience with snakes. This doesn't really display the power of positive thinking. It's definitely not pacifying. Even my, my dentist, when I'm sitting back in the chair, he's got these beach scenes pacifying above my head. Not bronze sculptures of drills or root canal diagrams. Snakes. Some of you are probably even creeped out at the word. Did you know one third of humans have a phobia of snakes? It tops our categories of innately creepy, gross things. Even more than that, considering where we're getting this story from, that in the creation myth, the serpent was the creature that brought evil and brokenness into the world. You'd think that it would be last on the list of potentially redemptive metaphorical symbols. Some commentators guess at why they chose this. Yeah, there are a lot of ancient stories that involve snakes and their mythical healing powers. The Greeks, in particular, loved the idea of balanced forces, that medicines can be both healing and harmful. A surgeon must cut through flesh to remove a tumor. Too much of a good drug will kill you. It could also be, maybe, the regenerative powers of snakes that they thought they had. The shedding of the skin, like the cycle of a rebirth. But I wonder if it's not something else going on here at a deeper level. Because when we jump forward to the gospel today, we find a different interpretation. Jesus said, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that anyone who believes in him may have eternal life. If it was a snake that caused the pain, then the snake would be raised. But that wasn't enough. Snakes will do what naturally occurring snakes will do. The deeper issue was always us. So if it were a human being who caused pain and death, then it would be a human being who could save us. You must look at what hurt. Only then can you find healing. Look at the form of death. And only then can you live, not ignoring it, not running away from it, not excusing it or renaming it, facing it, naming it. This is not what the world says. We've built our society around not seeing the poor, the lame, the dirty, the discomforting. We build our lives, don't we? Chasing and pretending to some ideal of blissful, secure, serpent-free happiness, and shudder to think sometimes alone in the dark night, if people only knew. Now, I do think there are those out there who spend their lives looking at the serpent. 
that I think there are those who overdose on all the hurts and mortifications and slights and grievances, those who video the experience to memorize every move and relive it endlessly. You know them? But there is a balance that results in getting the poison out. The cure takes the shape of the illness. Sacrifice creates life. These strange stories that we tell touch on the deepest mysteries of what we're trying to convey here. A stranger becomes a brother. We give our lives to save them. We go to the wilderness to face the worst within and without us. And maybe there, you'll find yourself lifted up and people who look on and say, that's what healing looks like. <laughs>